Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Associate Professor Giovanni Santamaria, Department of the School of Architecture and Design at NYIT. And I'm uh, uh, pleased to welcome our guest, Ginny Gang, architect Ginny Gang. And uh, I would like to welcome also our students, faculty, and friends of the School of Architecture and Design on behalf, on behalf of our Dean, Maria Perbellini. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure having you with us, uh, Ginny, and thank you for sharing your work, which is, I think, crucial for our students from an academic and a professional point of view. And I would like also to thank you, Tom, Professor Tom Verebes, for uh, organizing and making this uh, event possible. Thank you, and I uh, wish you to enjoy this event. Thank you, Giovanni, uh, for your warm welcome and also for the support for um, this uh, series and your contribution to the series of public events. Uh, good afternoon to our school community, uh, alumni and the public joining this event. Um, uh, this second presentation and student-led interview is part of a series of six public presentations and interviews within a graduate research seminar, Beyond the Envelope, uh, which I'm teaching for a second year here at New York Tech. Um, um, I'd like to thank the Lectures and Events Committee, uh, Alessandro Mellis, and especially Dean Perbellini, uh, for their support for incorporating the presentations and interviews in this seminar into our Spring 2022 Lectures and Events series. Uh, and thank you also to uh, MARC Director David Diamond for supporting a second run of this seminar. Uh, it's indeed an honor to welcome, uh, to join us today, Jeannie Gang, founding principal and partner of Studio Gang. Uh, who I'll introduce more comprehensively uh, in a moment. Um, researching pioneering architectural technologies and their impact on contemporary practice, uh, this graduate seminar course uh, explores contemporary modes of practice working at the frontiers of design, production, and construction technologies. The focus of the course is on the architectural envelope through the study of six exemplary building envelopes and of six seminal buildings completed within the first two decades of this century. Uh, each of these buildings corresponds to a theme uh, and our MARC students in this seminar are documenting and communicating their analyses of these projects through models and diagrams, also engaging in readings of our six projects and writing texts on their insights. Uh, in this second public presentation interview of this series, the theme is modularity components and mass customization and the corresponding project is Studio Gang's Mirror Tower, completed in 2021 in San Francisco. Uh, briefly, the five other uh, thematic sessions and the corresponding projects uh, and presenters include, two weeks ago, we had James von Klemper from KPF presenting One Vanderbilt and the theme of Vassing and Materiality. Uh, in two weeks from now, Form and Geometry, we're, we're pleased to have uh, Wolf Pricks will join us. Uh, to present and be interviewed on the Mokape project in Shenzhen. Uh, climate and Energy fosters Gherkin, uh, Visuality, Cognition and Experience, Diller, Scafidi and Renfro's Shed project. Um, and lastly, uh, Interaction, Responsiveness and Smartness. Peter Cook will join us to discuss his Kunsthaus Graphs project. Um, a few words on the Mirror Tower. Uh, within today's theme, Modularity and Mass Customization, the Mirror Tower stands as a beacon for recent innovations in material production in an era of accelerated industrial change. Amidst this transitory technological context, the legacy of Fordism, evident in architecture's continued dependency on, on the processes of standardized mass production, persists as an, as an industrial paradigm. Modernist housing in the first half of the 20th century was the target for prototypes which increasingly embraced repetitious system-based architecture. Well into the 21st century by now, housing remains one of the most standardized sectors in architecture, often constrained by cost limitations, standards, codes, and conventions, especially for mass housing. In this light, the mirror tower advances the paradigm shift to more flexible manufacturing modes through the customization of facade systems to create a family of bay windows, which in turn are mapped onto a differentiated set of apartment layouts and arrayed vertically in a series of distinct floor plans. Shunning the uniformity of housing offerings, the Mira provides generously a variety of demographic and lifestyle preferences and economic means. This project demonstrates quite beautifully the potential for numerically controlled fabrication processes to create differentiated systems, spaces, and effects. 
Perhaps the most striking impact of the mirror tower is due to the visual and urban effects of its dynamically vibrating facades as seen as, as an experience from the ground and really at any distance. In this project, Studio Gang states its values for an architecture of ruggedness over planarity, geometric articulation over blankness, dynamism over stillness, and of a relative solidity of the massing over modernism's long love affair with transparency. The mirror tower bypasses the bias for continuous surfaces and curvilinearity inherent to many tendencies of contemporary and recent digital modeling practices. The architecture of the mirror tower presents its public face in high resolution granularity made possible by the dynamic visual effects of the transformational geometries of its architectural skin. In today's event, we're honored to have uh, with us uh, Jeannie Gang. Uh, Jeannie is the founding a principal and partner of Studio Gang, an international architecture and urban design practice headquartered in Chicago. Known for an inquisitive approach to design that unfolds new technical and material possibilities and expands the active role of designers in society, Jeannie creates striking places that connect people with each other, their communities and the environment. This approach has produced award-winning projects throughout the Europe and the Americas that range from cultural and community buildings like Writers Theatre and the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership to structurally dynamic towers like the St. Regis Chicago and the Mirror Tower in the spotlight of today's event. Ongoing work includes the expansion to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, a new United States Embassy in Brasilia, and the University of Chicago's European Hub for Study and Research in Paris. Intertwined with built work, Jeannie and the studio also develop research, publications, and exhibitions that push design's ability to create public awareness and give rise to change, a practice Jeannie calls actionable idealism. A MacArthur Fellow and a professor of practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, Jeannie has been honored with the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture and been named one of the most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. We're grateful, Jeannie, you can join us today to share your presentation and then to participate in a brief interview, um, which will be student led by MARC students uh, Adnan Jangbarwala and Seth Mears. Join me, please, in welcoming Jeannie Gang, founding principal and partner of Studio Gang. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks for that big round of applause. I know you were doing it, but it I just couldn't hear it. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, kidding. But I, I'm very happy to be here today to, to speak with students and also see some of my colleagues from Studio Gang joining. So that's kind of cool too. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to share my screen. And get going. And so we have about uh, 20 minutes and save time for um, mm -hmm. talking at the end. Um, Thanks for that nice introduction, Tom, and which gives a little bit more of an overview of the kind of projects that we're working on and the values that we have and the, that we share within our collective here at Studio Gang. Um, because we're talking today about modularity and, and um, the subject at hand, I thought I would uh, also mention that um, the very strong interest, let's say, in curvilinearity and un unmodular systems that we also explore, um, mainly because of a, a connection to two things about curves, uh, if you will. This connection to nature and fluidity, um, flow, but also the aspect of how they work in the environment with light. And, and you know, so the aqua towers, um, really works on that level and also is able to eke out advantages from things that are not modular. Uh, similarly with the American Museum of Natural History, um, a project that is being built right now in New York on the Upper West Side in, at the museum is being constructed completely without formwork in order to be able to, um, to achieve the, the curvilinear surfaces and this sense of flow that is also very key to the function of that museum and the, the kind of spirit of it, of discovery. So having said that, I thought maybe like a couple, just a couple of projects that, that do work with modularity and difference, um, it often comes uh, to be a subject 
in doing tall designing tall buildings um, because of their huge amount of materials and and the need for um, to be constructed in the least amount of time let's say because not only for uh, the benefit of the owner but also for the benefit of of being living in a city I, I don't know if any of you have experienced living next to a construction site but it's not exactly wonderful so the faster that um, a construction site can be completed you know there's less disturbance around it less pollutants and, and everything for the neighbors nearby this is the hoyt uh, tower that was completed recently it's in brooklyn which has a very interesting amount a wide variety of types of of spaces within it and a lot of shared spaces for the um the apartment dwellers and with that project as a concrete project concrete um skin and and structure we were trying to achieve modularity uh, repetition but but also uh, gain difference so you can see some of the early modeling that we do in the office very uh, simple and crude this is just a picture of the model sitting in front of our window at the new york office um, and then it becomes really how to you know achieve things like that um, and, and with this project in particular, a very interesting system of double donuts, as they're called, um, working with um, slight differences in this precast elements that um, always looking for this benefit for the, the inside and the outside. So in this case, we've been really interested in bay windows. In this case, th these types of modular bays give you this kind of extra space inside the building which is definitely needed in, in um, New York apartments and, and people can do different things with them. And, and so the, these were prefabricated units that include this kind of extra storage bookcase and, and, and window seat within them. So oftentimes we're trying to just get that, that extra feeling of inside and out, get light from more than one direction. Um, you might not have seen this project. It was recently completed in St. Louis um, called 100, very close to Wash U, um, and and its um, skin is is really a, com um, a combination of curtain wall and and metal, um, and it really uses um, it uses a lot of the techniques that we're going to speak about with Mira uh, to, for its enclosure. But here, really um, working with um, this tilted system that reduces heat gain in the building. Um, and then a kind of panelized system in, in the in the curve portions. Um, and then one more, which is maybe people know is the solar carve building, which is a, it was actually a spec building. Um, and that means that we didn't know who was gonna be using it or if it would be residential or, or uh, commercial, frankly. And so um, we worked with the owners and, and it's right along the high line um, and realized that our building would be shading the, the gardens of the High Line, if we were to build as of right, and in other words, to build it as uh, the code, the zoning code um, requires. Um, and oftentimes with building in New York, you find that the owner will hire an architect just to get the maximum envelope for the building, um, and then hire an architect to do the kind of, you know, make it look good. And then they hire another architect to do the interior, and in this case, we were so lucky because we worked directly with the owner of the land and they were in interested in this approach whereby we would shift the massing of the building away from High Line because the High Line is, in fact, an interior block um, public space. So it doesn't conform with the regular zoning and, that, and therefore we were able to uh, get this passed with an argument, you know, let's not overcrowd the High Line. So these are some of the modular and window wall systems, the unitized systems that we used on the project um, in order to, like I said, you know, reduce the time on site and, and to make it buildable and, and beautiful. So those carved areas that are defined by the sunlight and views from the High Line um, are really special areas on the inside as well. And then you can read those uh, from the outside. Um, and then one more thing is just like modularity can be used um, in different ways to get like interesting difference. That, that's what I think we're really excited about. So in this case, um, 
to reduce the heat loss through a concrete slab when you have balconies, we came up with this um, balcony stem, which is shown in green in this view, which takes the gravity loads down to the ground, which allows us to create a break between the inside and outside. Um, but we didn't stop there. Um, this is a model of, of the balcony stem on the right. Uh, we looked at how those could be changed, but remain uh, repetitive and buildable, but changed to create different conditions for the, um, the residents, like uh, different types of balconies. Um, and, and in doing that, it creates this almost like mind dizzying uh, pattern on the facade, almost Escher-esque kind of excitement on the south facing facade of the building uh, with balconies that are sometimes in innies, we call them, or sometimes shel sheltered from two sides. Sometimes they become almost like a diving board, really stretching out. So people can have different experiences, different apartments, uh, different um, qualities of threshold uh, from the inside to the out, which is um, unique work living in a tower. Okay, so now moving into Mira um, Tower, which is um, in San Francisco, and it's on this block called Trans Bay Block Number One. And the reason why it's called that kind of boring name was because it was an urban um, it was an urban design project by the city who had to replan um, blocks of the city after this. Uh, earthquake um, that that brought down a, a lot of the infrastructure in this area. I, well, this is just my shot of the area is right around the ferry uh, terminal building. Um, I love birds, so I'm always like looking at buildings and, and birds in the same shot. But here we go. Um, this is the ferry terminal building. Uh, this is this elevated freeway that that, as you can see in this older image, um, completely cut off the city from the waterfront. And we see that a lot in cities, the, the urban renewal, the, the infrastructure boom in the 60s and 70s and even 80s, where people um, pr prioritize traffic movement over pedestrian access directly to the, um, the waterfront. And the waterfront is really treated more as a loading dock in a certain way. But um, Nature intervened here. Um, here, oh, look at this view. I mean, it's a wall between the city and the, and the beautiful San Francisco Bay and the Bay Bridge there in the back. So not a great um, solution for that. The, somehow the traffic engineers were able to um, get this through. I don't know how, but um, in 1989, there was an earthquake Pietra Loma earthquake, I think it was called, that um, did a lot of damage to the infrastructure, this elevated infrastructure, and, and particularly to the area right around this, the um, ferry building in the Trans Bay area. Um, and so that provided the first opportunity. And what happened is this people in San Francisco said, we don't want to build this back. Let's, let's take it down. And they basically took down the freeway and, and look at what it, it looks like today. Unbelievable transformation with this incredible public space market um, terminal for the ferries, uh, build for the ferry um, lines right on the waterfront. So this is the kind of context of this project. We were on the site of one of the off ramps of the, um, the Trans Bay, the freeway, um, at the that was going up here to meet the Embarcadero. So this was like one of the off ramps here on Folsom Street. Um, and um, the plan for it was already somewhat determined by the city because they had done a master plan for each of the blocks that were being reinvented. So you can see this future Trans Bay Park here, which is not yet a park, but it will be um, trying to take advantage of this, this this disaster and, and put some really more pedestrian friendly and public facing spaces. So when we arrived at the site, it was a parking lot. Uh, this is a county government building on the right and um, a tower on, across the street from um, another architect that I'm blanking on their name right now, <laughs> sorry. It, it, which was 
done just, uh, you know, not uh, Architectonica, sorry. Architectonica did two towers, uh, glass towers right across the street and um, of about the same size. And so um, you can see here a, kind of a site analysis that we were really looking at the, um, the connectivity of this site at the time when we started the project, it still felt a little bit vacant, I guess you could say, um, but looking at how it can transform in the future and, and trying to get our head in that when you approach a site that's very um, empty, sometimes it, it's hard to imagine what it can be. Um, and so we were um, asked to design a 300 foot tower that was planned for the site with a podium um, and the podium would be in the in the plan they called for affordable housing. Um, and so as we started to look at this mix, uh, the 65% uh, market rate housing and 35% affordable, um, we wanted to make sure that we could get the affordable housing, the I think they just call it below market rate housing, um, into both the tower and the podium and to make sure that the whole um, ground plane doesn't feel segregated into these two different spaces um, and that everybody would share the same lobby and amenities. Um, we share this, these values with our, our client as well. So it's really a mix of different um, building types together on this block where the tower location was already defined. Um, when we started looking at it, we thought, you know, the 300 foot tower looks pretty stubby when you compare it to the things around it. And um, we went in and asked for additional height. And the reason being the, um, the city was falling behind on their affordable and below market rate housing. And we thought that if we could offer more of that and help them, you know, up the average, that maybe they would give us the additional height. Um, and so this whole process was kind of taking a long, uh, a long way. And we, we were able to, which is incredible in this tower to do a 40% overall it's a 40% um, affordable below market rate mix 40, 60 um, and bring up the units into the tower um, and, and have a real mix um, at the ground. So that was good. They approved that um, and that helped our proportions quite a bit for this building project. Um, we were starting out looking at just what types of buildings people like in the city that has such great light sometimes and then it, it gets you know covered in fog other times but when the light is there it's an incredible beautiful light and the bay window that was uh, so popular in these um, turn of the century buildings um, are kind of the I guess it's the iconic painted lady they call them of uh, San Francisco with as you can see how they work in a row, it, it allows people to have these different qualities of light. Um, and from the inside, of course, you get this projection um, out into the, the city. And we thought that with, maybe we could try to deploy this in different ways on the building and to capture the, the views around the ferry terminal building and, and the Bay Bridge um, and the city skyline. Um, so that, you, you know, what typically you get in tall buildings is like a, a shoebox shape that gives you one orientation. So this was our attempt to um, mix that up. There's also a lot of really interesting buildings in San Francisco that, that are commercial buildings that use bay windows um, as well. So there was a lot of precedent for this. Um, we started out looking at these benefits and how deep something like this could be. Um, um, again, this I come back to nature a lot because there's a lot of order. There's order in nature that is there for a reason, um, usually performance reason. It's nature can be brutally efficient, let's say. Um, um, in this case, uh, this spiraling growth that you get in, in um, nature from everything from a tree trunk to how seeds are deployed around, you know, in a, in a pod to, if you think of like DNA helix, those are all 
aspects of using this twist um, and this twisting quality, which in in the tower, I guess what we were trying to go for was um, variety on different floors, not all the units being the same, um, different views, serendipity, um, those kind of things. Um, and a way to deploy those, these are some earlier sketches of, of thinking about this slight changes that could happen over a number of floors. Um, one thing that you can notice in the sketch on the right is the biggest problem that comes up from this idea is having like a little miniature roof and a little miniature soffit on um, all over the building, all over the building which means, you know, potential for water to get in potential, uh, lots of surfaces, complexity, um, all the reasons why it isn't usually done, let's say. Um, so that was really the kind of technical challenge of the project. At the same time, you know, um, figuring out how many different things there should be um, and, and what qualities they bring to the interior of the units um how we would get solid and void this in the middle is is showing some mathematical like arrangements of the bay windows that we we used um to try to um regularize the the all the different parts and pieces so there would be some logic to it again you know to convince the owner to convince to to work with the budget all of those things that are these extreme pressures on high-rise buildings. You think about, you know, the Aqua Tower has something like five miles of handrail on it. <laughs> and so if you make a, some kind of small um, efficiency somewhere, it, it really adds up. So that's the kind of, I don't know, I, I find it fascinating and also, um, it's like, it's the fun game of like the actual building process. So once that idea is in place, how do you work with um, these constraints? Um, so this kind of series shows where we ended up with the, the quantity of change, the, the way that we deployed the change. Um, so you can kind of see what the window is. Um, we have 11 um, different if you can see these these changes down here, there's a there's a very key diagram that shows the dimensions of how deep the bays go out, up to seven feet in in depth, um, and how much they change per thing. Oh, by the way, this is also as you can see, it's an earthquake area. So a tower with um, a very stiff core is good. It performs very well. A tower without, do you guys know what reentrant corners are? that those are very bad in earthquake areas. So you want it to be stiff and to, when it shakes, you know, to, to not have uh, floors that are starting to shake at different rates. So there's a very strong reason to, to have a tower in, in this kind of compact way. And, and that really helped us to, um, to focus our energies on like this, this relationship between the inside and outside in, in the bay window. Um, here you can see how those are deployed over 11 floors differently. That's what's shown in the, in the diagram below. And then this is the real um, you know, discovery, I guess, but um, hat trick, if you will, of shifting these up and down and but making sure that people have balconies and here's what that looks like on the bottom. It almost looks like a kind of lace <laughs> doily or something. Um, but, but what that represents is this kind of transformation of the floors over time, over the height. And these are, this is roughly the, there's the very stiff rectangular core. There are the, um, the basic unit layouts, but you know, they, there's a lot of variety within that. Um, and then this is how the, the, the tower sits on the site. We, as I said, we were approved for the 400 foot tower. Um, and um, what this environmental strategies could be in this compact site um, 
include a lot of the water collection uh, that's uh, lots of connections to the transportation around so the areas for bikes uh, lots of um, besides the performance these other aspects of greening the roof and keeping um, tied into the local networks uh, that's perry in the office working out how this looks in uh, a solid model um, so that we could really and there were many different iterations of this by the way to test uh, the amount of different varieties we could we could handle um, and accommodate. And this was a rendering. I think one of these renderings I was telling the class earlier, it was the one that, that I used a lot of white out on um, as a as a editing tool. So let's go back out to the site for a second and you can see this this um, below grade uh, level of parking and then um, ground level and then um, this is this this pocket kind of a pocket park that um, attempts to make the block a little more porous or make outdoor spaces within the middle of the block. So it was suggested in the overall um, development that the city gave us. Oh, and then I'll go back to that, but I wanted to show you a transformation over the levels of these different angles now that they're starting to get worked out with the plans um, and how uh, the, the units change in each case. Um, one of our clients mentioned to me that he, because we also looked at a round version of this, he mentioned, you know, we really need to make it so people can buy an ordinary rectangular carpet and it will still work. So I, I'm just showing like kind of down, look, going down the, the tower, how that um, rotation happens. Okay, so it's not really changing a lot of the unit layouts, or that's what we argued. And um, as we got into the townhomes, we tried to make spaces. This turned out to be great during COVID, like um, a one bedroom with, with kind of work spaces. Um, they're smaller apartments, but to make them really efficient and make them nice and with also having bay, bay windows. Here's some sketches from the um, Pocket Park at early, early days, how to get up to it. Um, we ended up using the pocket park for access to these townhomes, that the upper level townhomes are accessed through this, this open pocket park. And then there's a laneway on the north where the lower townhomes are accessed. So there's a lot of different variety of unit types here. Here's the townhomes and this little, um, um, Clementina has a street, which is a little laneway that um, also cuts through the block. So they, they were really attentive in the master plan to making sure we didn't have these super blocks. This is our landscape uh, plan, looking just at all where all the plantings are, where there's terraces, the, the units, it's kind of blurred in between inside. <laughs> it's hard to tell where the building is, but um, it does have a lot of green. And so underneath the pocket park is the shared gym. And we have these skylights that uh, bring light down into natural light down into the gym and you can see the big deep um, planters that that allow us to plant on the roof at the ground level just really uh, you know visually accessible we kind of wanted to pull this residential down as much as possible to create more life on the street and not have some big grandiose you know ground floor um, so you can really be connected to street life in this tower. And this is the, the stair heading up to the pocket park. This is just to mention that you know, all of this is not done by a few people. It's done by a lot of people. We, we have a big team internally. Our, our team, we have um, landscape architects we're working with, people who work on interior. And, and this is one of our charrettes where we were you know, getting down into the details um, with our team. And it's it's really is a team affair. Um, this is Mauricio and Jordan in a mock-up that they made of like what the size of the space would be for the um, the the low-rise building. So we really taped it out on the floor in order to make sure that these spaces felt good. So that's Mauricio sitting at the area I was telling you about, where you have like a little desk areas, which turned out to be a great design feature. So these are for the below market rate units, but they have really um, been thought through as deeply as the tower units. 
Um, now let's get into just quickly the, um, the prefabrication and the solution to the folded bays and the soffits and the roofs. Um, the idea was to um, have a kind of a system that could be all installed, all including waterproofing insulation and exterior skin all at once. Um, and so the challenge was really to get that to come together and to work well. And it, it's not an easy challenge. You can see a lot of drawings here from the, the process, how those would be supported, um, how they would be the steps of which they would fold the metal and put all the pieces together. And, and then, um, you know, where are the joints going to be when they come together? It, for a while, we had this um, idea of having a secondary texture in, in the metal. So we were really playing with more, even more pattern. Um, this shows how those panels would be stiffened and folded. And we started to discover, you know, what the problems, where we were encountering, encountering problems and made changes uh, very early in the process. So this is going on simultaneously, um, you know, with the development of the plants. Here's a couple of mock-ups of with this finish and some of the more texture that we originally had. Um, and these are mock-ups out at a facility that we went to inspect. And again, looking at, it was such a key part of this process in order to do something like this, which hadn't really been done um, in this, with this prefabrication. Um, this was a, you know, a lot of problems discovered on this mock-up full scale that were not exactly great. Um, so there was a lot of work to be done and this went on for quite a while to perfect those, those units. Oh, I was lucky to be in Italy when we did this um, water test on the facade. This is gonna be loud. So just, just telling you, um, you take a jet engine and blow water at the facade here. See if I can play it. So plug your ears if you're- Sorry about that. I just wanted to show you what that is involves. You have this jet engine and it goes up and down over this facade element, blowing wind driven, you know, rain, replicating wind driven rain. And you just look at all of the um, seams and, and the windows and, and that whole test. Um, I was lucky enough, like I said, to be there so I could um, experience it, see it, work with the team to see what, what the issues were. And of course that just building that mock-up had a whole set of architectural drawings as well that that um, were, um, it was a pretty big set actually, just to build that one mock-up. So you can see it's not taken lightly. I mean, sometimes people say that um, when I talk about buildings, it makes it sound like it was easy, but it never is. And there's a lot of hard work going into these things. So that's at Permis Lisa. And when we started looking at, they were the chosen contractor to create these um, prefabricated facade elements. And that's showing how the two of them would stack on a truck. But when I saw this mock-up, I knew the building was gonna be good. It was like, it was like, oh, this is, it's really good. Um, you can oh just here also see the choices of where the seams would be and all of that was very intricate. So just getting now into construction, here's the big site, the hole in the site um, starting out. Um, here's just way up now in the building where we have um, somebody, the sizes of these pieces are such that, you know, they could be handled. They're not, they don't, they could, two guys can uh, lift it up and put it in there and um, they're starting to put together the pieces. And this one, in this view, you can really see the little um, roofs, the miniature roofs that are part of the system. Um, this, this was fun to see, starting to see it, you know, really get its cladding. Here's the Architectonica buildings across the street, which are the same height. Um, and it has this incredible, luminosity and I think it, it that again it comes back to this why do things captivate us in nature it's because they have change and difference and work differently as a light they, they don't 
people do mention that yes buildings can look different in different lights yes but this one looks different all the time and the light affects it differently over the height of the building so it, it really has this movement and growth quality to it um it it geometry there's no curves but it kind of looks curved in a certain way um and then, and then i was going to mention I, my time's running out but just the the top um what do you do with the top i mean it, it, i love new york skyline for all of the excitement about the tops but this is not really a building that's about the top <laughs> and we we it's about the middle in a certain way um and when it came to the top we looked at different tops but honestly it really just the top wanted to be simple we um and so it, and again we so we went to this kind of radius uh corner on the top screen for the mechanical and the overrun um i'm really happy with that how that came out instead of doing a corner because the whole building is about seeing more than one side and then you know if we just stopped with a with a square corner it would be one side in the light one side in the dark here it's like modulates it just a little bit just enough but keeps it simple um here's walking around the base of the building um this is the stair going up to that pocket park and there's you know retail at the base these are the uh, below market rate uh, units um this is the townhome uh, side on on um, this little small street that cuts through the block. This is the um, pocket park there with the skylights, which I'll show you in a second. Here again is the um, the stairs up to it. This is the front door to the tower. Let's say it's the you know what it which is just it, it's incredible the the action starts right away <laughs> um, inside the lobby. And so the bay windows even, you know, kind of help animate the lobby space. These are some of the common spaces, the portal that goes to the elevator. This is from the gym, which is shared, like I said, both below market rate and market rate. These are the skylights that, that take light from the pocket park. There's some other outdoor shared spaces. And then I just finish off with some um, shots of the, the building that, that uh, people either sent me or, or were taken. Again, it's like a building that's so much about the, the middle section, uh, but when you're like really on some of the balconies, you get um, incredible relationships between um, the different units and the and the balconies. This is one of those ones where you can really see what light, how it changes across the, just from the clouds, just from the clouds that are in the sky, uh, looking straight up. And then inside, of course, this is probably one of the bigger units, but you do definitely get the feeling of the bay window. Oops. And then that's just kind of its neighborhood. And I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, one more. That's it. <laughs> so I'm, I'll stop sharing and, and uh, take questions. Thank you very much, Jeannie, for your wonderful, comprehensive presentation. And you know, your generosity for sharing so much of the detail of the process of uh, designing and constructing the, the mirror tower along with um, uh, some other related past and uh, concurrent projects. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, our MARC students, uh, Agnang uh, Jangbarwala and Seth Mears, who will conduct uh, a public interview. So for everybody, please stay online. Um, thank you for your wonderful and descriptive presentation. Um, we would like now uh, to ask you a few questions regarding the Tower project and more generally about Studio Gang's work. Um, reflecting on the historical context of San Francisco, the Bay Window, indigenous to San Francisco, amplifies the views out of a residence in a context with vast views. As you have stated, the Muir Tower reinvents the San Francisco Bay Window. The shape of the angles of the Muir Tower's Bay Windows not only gives every unit classic views of San Francisco, but also establishes the historical and contextual value of this project. Um, does this new prototype of a reinvented bay window have the potential to become a new standard to be replicated on 
other maybe high rise projects in San Francisco? Can you foresee the Mirror Tower Bay Window concept to lead to the emergence of a new type of differentiated Bay Window to influence other projects in the future in San Francisco or elsewhere? Thanks for that question. Yeah, I, I really do think that um, the, this approach that we've begun with the bay windows and also with balconies, by the way, um, I do see that catching on and um, I do see it being uh, hopefully helpful for you know others to develop buildings that, that make use of it, um, so especially with the, the you know, when you, I guess you picked buildings that were already completed and you know I'm sure people have designed buildings that might have used um, certain elements but but getting getting it done uh, I think we were really on the forefront of that and um, the point is to to you know pave the way make it possible for other people to make use of this technology when they see uh, how it was achieved, it could hopefully inspire other designs that, that would make use of that. It's, it's about adding to the quality of, of living space. And I think that that could be, even if you were building a place that didn't have such a strong bay window typology, uh, I think it would be a wonderful um, way to give people better light, make make an extra space in a, what would have been a shoebox um, and really you know kind of expand what it means to live in a tower. So yes, I, I think for sure it's it's helping add to that um, body of knowledge and and hopefully will be um, expanded upon, changed and, and every, everything going forward. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'll move on to my next question. Another way to characterize the context of this project is its industrial and technological context. Despite the enduring legacy of Fordism, architecture is actively pursuing the transition in the guiding industrial paradigm for a model of standard standardization and mass production towards increasingly flexible manufacturing and the potential for greater variation in possible products of industrial processes or mass customization. Housing is notoriously one of the most standardized sectors in architecture, constrained by cost limitations, especially on mass housing, in which the ubiquity of sameness triumphs through repetitious standardization. Um, thank you for explaining how the Mirror Tower project applies repetition to achieve the, um, the appearance of extreme specificity and uniqueness. And in this, this sense, how much standardization is required for the customization of the project. Um, however, why have so many of the differentiated systems of the mirror tower been produced abroad um, by fabricators and manufacturers based far away, for example, Italy and Thailand, as pre-manufactured modules delivered and installed on site? Um, were there no locally based fabricators with the background and credentials to achieve your intentions? Mm. Yeah, you touch on something, a very important point about like what's happening with the building industry in general, which is, um, you know, it relies on a, a very wide global network of, of manufacturers and producers. And, and it would be, um, I, I often think about that question, especially to do with mass timber, where, you know, we're in locally, take Chicago, for example, surrounding it could be, um, areas of producing sustainably produced forests and um, mass timber production. But no, it has to come you know, from a place that's already established that and sometimes even from Europe. So you know, we're suffering from um, the, I guess the production of the industrial revolution where things become so efficient that um, it's very hard to for someone who makes something to um, win the day against the people that do a very specific thing all the time and have made it so efficient that they are hard to beat in terms of the cost and delivery and the uh, performance of the thing that they're making. Um, and yeah, so 
to, to answer your question, no, there wasn't um, a, a local fabricator that could match the quality of the uh, the window wall that I think Italy has become a really um, dominant in in um, curtain wall systems, different kinds of exterior envelope systems. Um, right now, I, that could change in the future, but 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 that's the way it is right now. And you know, as as the architect, what is your role in this? You can try to find um, things that are locally made, and of course, we do that as much as possible, or things that are made using recycled material, or I know like you can try with when it comes to high rise it is pretty difficult like i said in the beginning you know a factor a small factor of change in in the cost or in the performance um gets multiplied so many times so there becomes it becomes a huge uh, gap between pricing but also quality you know you don't want to have a weakness in this facade system because imagine all of the problems with everyone owning their own condominium, for example, <laughs> um, how many complaints could add up. So this is, it really has to perform. It really has to um, meet the budget. And so that's what has happened in our, um, our global economy that we have. So um, as, an, as an architect, like, I, you know, we can observe this and see, we can, try to find things but but we really don't have the power to you know demand where something comes from at this point thank you for the detailed clarification um so in our seminar we are looking at six outstanding built projects analyzed in relation to a set of six themes this week's theme is modularity components and mass customization with the mirror tower exemplifying this topic um, the building reads as though it has a multitude of unique floor plans and facades. Um, you have elaborated how you conceive the relationship between various differentiated systems in the project from bay windows to unit types and the repetition to units aggregating in floor types and floors repeating. Mm -hmm. What is the underlying logic to the custom spatial and material organization to enable the project to be cost effective yet still able to create an array of unique and differentiated experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that what I was mentioning about this footprint, the core, the, the seismic activity in the area and the, and the need for a very stiff, simple core was kind of the basis. And um, I wanted to go back to this mass customization question because I think one of the first proposals that we made for the building that ultimately became the Aqua Tower was um, was a more a mass customized like facade, so people could, you know, choose their own windows, for example. Um, and the difficulty with that idea at the time was one is you know producing it truly customized to what someone wants, um, like you would do with your tennis shoes, I guess, you know, you could say what color, what all the different details. Um, but the, the problem that we came into with that, which I don't think is, you know, something that can, it's not insurmountable, is, is the marketing of, of an apartment, and then and the time when you have to buy the facade as in terms of a construction project, versus the time when you start to sell the, the building. So for example, you know, you would have to sell way in advance something that someone doesn't even know what it looks like yet. And they would have to have enough foresight to be able to customize it um, in advance because the, the, the actual you know, materials for the facade is bought way in advance of when, and it starts to be prepared way in advance of when you start to you know tour the building so so that was kind of the hang up with that it's not as exactly as easy as a pair of tennis shoes so um but but um so that that puts the architect in the role of trying to define what what kind of differences can we offer and to plan ahead of time different kinds of units different 
um, sizes, different aspects, different uh, qualities. Um, kind of imagining, you know, I guess we use ourselves as as the test as, as the test case. Like, what would we like? Um, and then we we try to um, come up with those variety of solutions that people would like. So, but it's a really interesting question that you bring up about mass customization. Thank you. I'll be now giving it to Seth to continue the call. <clears throat> uh, in more, in probing more technical issues of design, fabric fabrication, manufacturing, uh, the pair of metrics of facade geometries are resolved in-house and largely pre-manufactured off-site. Um, from your presentation, we learned about what discoveries or innovations in design and production have been learned during this project that basically led to a new set of technical rules and practices at practices. Um, and so I'll ask a couple of questions about the different um, technical aspects of constructing the building and the just the ones that you can answer. Um, why were the bay window modules made out of a single bent piece of aluminum rather than assembling and mechanically fixing multiple elements together? Um, what exactly were the construction and installation challenges faced on site? I know you had talked a little bit about the facade and some of the issues that that had, but more like specifically, what were those issues? Um, uh, why was there a need to angle the columns in the project? And then how did the scheme arise from mounting the prefabricated prefabricated facade on brackets? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Let's see. I have to try to remember which one. I'll start with the last one first. So, well, the the exterior piece, having one piece of folded metal and and um, it's a it's a balance between, well, first not wanting seams to be able to leak water into the the folded element of the bay. Um, so you know, folding it is better than like welding it together. Plus welding it together would be much more labor intensive than the fold. Um, so the fold can be done with one piece of material. Um, it's, it's a material that's, um, there aren't any kind of seams in it. So it's better quality. And then uh, the balance is between like how, thin can you go to reduce the material but with by keep but keeping it from oil canning and through um you know working together with different manufacturers you know not ourselves on our own we work very closely with the people that are devising the you know the, the different systems and they you know sometimes they will come up with an idea and we see we then take that idea and go back to the building and see how it would work. So uh, really the final design is the, this balance between the, the right gauge of metal, uh, metal that can be finished in the right way, the right stiffness, how much you need for you know, the, the stiffening factor inside those, those panels. Um, it's a back and forth. And you know the aim is to get the, the quality without um, with using less material, like I said, like the less material, the less carbon. So um, that's that's what we're going for there. Um, problems on site, I think ma mainly this project suffered from being built during a very big building boom in San Francisco. So, you know, just the competition to get, you know, the, the teams, the, the materials, the the, um everything there and to to get it done quickly that that was always you know it, there was a lot being built in san francisco at this time uh lots of cranes up in the city um managing i guess th these are more contractor things i guess but how they could manage the different teams uh different types of i always think of you know tall buildings are oftentimes it's like a different guilds working at the same time on different floors so you know you have your the concrete team then and steel and then you have the plumbing teams and 
uh, electrical teams and the carpenters and they all are working in like in a vertical um, deployed vertically across the building and trying to keep out of each other's way so that but that's not exactly an architecture problem that's more of a um, the contractor needs to manage that um, I think uh, you know also we continue to work on this while while it was going into production on site we were finishing our work on the interiors, which we also designed at Studio Gang. So it was a little bit different than what I described in New York, where you always have a different um, interior designer. We did these interiors and, and coming up with the, um, the range of types of kitchens that people could have and, and, and all of the tile work and things like that. That was a big part of what we were doing while, while the building started construction. Um, what else did you ask? Um, um, about the angled columns that were used in the building. Wh which angled columns are you, are you talking about the facets on? The, so the columns are not angled, they're straight up and down, but they have to have different um, orientations based on, you know, what the bay is doing. Um, and so the column that we solution that we had for this building was really interesting. It's kind of like an octagon in a certain way, because it can it it made it possible for it to be not blocking light, a kind of rather smooth, um, but to marry up with the differences in the facades. But I don't know if that's the column angle columns you're talking about, because we really didn't have any angled columns like in section angle. They're more in plan. There are angles on them. Is that what you meant? Yeah, that, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then finally, the last question was about the how did the scheme arise for the like the prefabricated like panels that were mounted on the brackets, like the the wall facade. Um, well, it's the brackets are internal to the you know the prefabricated panels that also had like I said the waterproofing, the insulation, and and um, everything's in a sandwich that is pre-made and then yeah the, the attachments to the concrete is through a mechanical connection like a, a bracket on the on the concrete a bracket on the panel marry those up tighten it up <laughs> and you're good to go it, it sounds easier than it is actually i saw I like how they you know manipulating a big piece of material we tried to make these uh small enough for people to handle um but it's still a pretty big piece of material to to get it to lock in. So um, yeah, that that was interesting to see how that that came together. But in general, a lot better than you know melt layer after layer of different materials that you would put on with different trades. This was all like you know one trade installing it. So that also helped reduce the number of, of people getting each other's way on the site, and that's a very big factor in high-rise design. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing with us the precedents within your office's portfolio and other projects that inform the design of the Mira Tower. Uh, Studio Gang engages in a great variety of projects and your architecture engages in the broader cultural needs for society. Does the diversity of Studio Gang's projects reflect your, reflect your curiosity as a designer? or is it a reflection of the variety of project types, scales, programs, and clients within an architectural practice that generally sees as a commission? Do you see yourself mm -hmm. as a generalist or a specialist architect? Well, um, I think the medium is architecture, but the design approach and the, the is, is really, you know, it's unique to us, it's unique to me. It's like, what what's interesting to us and to me is um, projects that can have some kind of impact, um, positive impact on society. Um, and, you know, it's not always, it doesn't mean that you only uh, design, let's say community centers, although community centers is what I started with when I first started my practice, but it means that um, how does each, asking the questions of each program how could this be uh, something that, and the program 
might be, let's say, a bank. What what is it that a bank does for society? And we would step back and ask these questions, and 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 see how it plays a role in our our ecosystem of, of our social ecosystem of of being human and living in the cities. Um, and you know, there are things that every building can do. Maybe it's um, offering something back to the urban realm of a street, or maybe it is through the way that people, I think I mentioned in this building, like everyone uses the same door, even though there are different um, economic levels of people in the building, there's a, there's a feeling of um, equality. And when you get home, you come through the same door, use the same, um, lobby and it it feels welcoming for everyone so so i think in in every single project that you can take on you looking try to look at it through these different lenses and how it's participating in the city um but of course you know the, that's that one part of a project but it's also like the materiality how it's built those are all things that i find very fascinating so um I'm a designer. I'm a, a you know a, cr a creative person, and I um, I respond to like I'd like to try things, different things. I guess <laughs> it's not a great answer. It's oh, okay. it's um, um, some people like to specialize and to just hone a groove, okay? And there and you can get wonderful things coming out of that approach. Um, the things that I'm working on to hone are it's, it's hard to put them because they're maybe they're not exactly the same formally, but there is a cohesiveness to the work and the practice. It doesn't look like when you see a studio gang project, you can tell it's a studio gang project, even if it's made out of a different material or a different program, there's a sensibility to it, I guess. Um, but, um, but there's an experimentation and that's just, that is coming from a love of discovering new things and a love of pushing and and um on a bigger scale that i think you can discover new things even if you are doing that approach that's more um iterative of the same you discover things it's just a different scale of discovery i i, I guess does that make sense yeah no, uh, really. <laughs> yeah very much about like discovery and that kind of thing um finally we'd like to conclude our interview with questions on the future of architecture in a rapidly evolving technological context. Um, what technology do, do you feel was lacking to further facilitate the design and construction of the Mira Tower? Well, I think that um, in general, we, we are still working in this orthographic way, I guess, as architects, we, and it's, it's a, it's a way that is changing and it's a way that we'll probably maybe not use going into the future, but right now we still need it. Like we need it because it's the language that we work with um, all of the people that go together to produce architecture. It's, and even, you know, in design, we still, we still can see things when we project them orthographically, um, sometimes better than when it's just a model that's that's three-dimensional zooming around it, it allows us to um, isolate things and analyze them so but i do see that that is also a uh, an impediment maybe for in, like going forward in the future it's a transition time that we're in where we will be probably no longer using that orthographic um, ideas, ideation at some point. Uh, but so that's, I think that's the biggest kind of technological shift. It's, it's, a, it's also an imagination shift. Um, and we're just scratching the surface of that right now, but um, I, I still, you know, it's still useful, very useful and needed, um, but, but um, eventually, that will, does that make, does, do you guys know what I'm talking about um, when I say 
this orthographic, we still use plans that are floor plans and wall sections and elevations and things that are not three-dimensional to convey information about the building. Um, and again, I still find those things useful, but I do see that they are um, a kind of different way. We're moving into a different sensibility that is more multifaceted, that's more, um, that will have many more factors to, to manage. Yeah. Um, kind of like going off of that, are you able to speculate on how architecture with respect to differentiated systems and their effects may evolve like in the next mm -hmm. decade or two and what innovations in automation, robotics, custom manufacturing do you think we may see just as mm -hmm. speculation? Yeah, I can say speculate, I don't know. I can say what I would like to see. Um, what I would, I would like to see is um, a kind of two prong thing where we, I don't, I, I really do like making. And I think that there's, a, if you think about how many people are in the world and if everybody is replaced with robots, like it takes away some of the kind of making qualities that you can get from handmade. Um, and I'm not talking so much about high rise really, but any building, like how can we, maybe technology can help us identify, like you were, someone was asking earlier, a local person, local source, local company uh, that can make something in a smaller batch um, to a quality that is acceptable. And, and you could use like multiple fabricators to create the building so that, that that kind of comes out of gets away from the Fordism that you were talking about where you have like you got to do the same thing over and over and over in a big uh, robotic plant and so so I wonder if technology could help us to be more custom and more local that could be amazing um, of course we're we we can do things faster and more efficiently with um, robotic production too. And that makes sense for certain things. So I guess I'd like to see evolution in both ways and um, it more distribution of, of making, um, like for example, if you wanted to have a, um, a designer, um, outfit, <laughs> could it be possible to be not made somewhere um, far away using low wages? And could it be, could it be somehow sourced to someone who's local closer to you uh, to create that? I, I think there's a lot of interesting things that technology could help us to achieve. I, I don't know if it's going to happen that way, but that, um, that could be a really good use of some of our newest technologies and, and sourcing things. Absolutely, thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeannie, for your generosity to join us today to present the work of Studio Gang and in particular Studio uh, uh, the Mirror Tower uh, and especially to be interviewed by our students today. We really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>